Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us Professor Ajaz Ahmed and we will be discussing the recent historic summit between President Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un of North Korea. Hello Professor Ahmed. Hello, so, how are you? I am doing well, thank you. So what would be your first thoughts on uh, the recent summit that took place in Singapore? I mean beyond all the optics and about the declaration specifically because there has been a lot of the US media has of course been going all out against Trump and even some sympathetic commentators have been slightly underwhelmed by the uh, declaration. So, what, how, do, how would you see it? Well, um, several things, Fair Prasad. One thing is that three of the five key players were not in the room. That is to say, South Korea, Russia, and China, uh, <clears throat> who had in fact made uh, all of this possible. Second thought that I have is that Trump needed very badly to have uh, some kind of success after the number of uh, problems he has created for himself in terms of his allies in, the, in Europe, in Canada, in Mexico. He has started so many conflicts, including with China on the question of tariffs, etc., that he needed uh, <clears throat> some sort of success story. Now, uh, my third thought is that Trump's primary concern at this moment is he's completely focused on getting reelected. And uh, everything that he does is actually directed at the domestic support base of the far right that he has, which he's trying to expand. And it is true that, that latently that base is much larger than the one he was able to tap at the time of the elections. And that is what the main concern here is for him, <clears throat> because so that this plays very well because he talks about how he is going to bring uh, the soldiers back, how he is a man who wants to make peace, he wants to de-escalate and so on and so forth. So there are three or four quite different uh, things going on there. Uh, the winner in all of this is of course North Korea and even more so perhaps South Korea. For North Korea, the great victory is that the President of the United States met on equal terms unconditionally with the leader of North Korea, uh, Chairman King. Um, this is quite extraordinary. Uh, and they uh, issued a declaration which again uh, affirms that the two will move towards eventual peace, eventual denuclearization through a process in which each side will match the uh, whatever the other side does. So that is going to be reciprocal, etc. So it isn't as if North Korea has given anything. So this is um, th for both sides. This was very important. For North Korea, it is very important to start this process because A, North Korea desperately needs some economic relief because sanctions are hurting a great deal. Uh, North Korea wants to become, to get itself integrated in the economic structure of the Eurasian landmass that is developing and uh, pursue the uh, policies that I once discussed on News Click about a month ago, where what they're looking for actually is uh, an eventual, eventual denuclearization with a guarantee from uh, five, uh, you know, a five power guarantee which will include Japan as well as South Korea, not to speak of China and Russia and so on. Uh, but that will be eventual. The point is to start this process 
which will give North Korea some relief and also the opportunity to uh, pursue uh, a much more comprehensive policy with South, with South Korea towards demilitarization, towards integration, etc., and uh, towards the essentially what is the Putin uh, plan for uh, the integration of the Koreas in a much larger plan. So it, it, North Korea wants that period of relief in which it can proceed to do those things. And uh, earlier in last time we had a discussion uh, with NewsClick, you mentioned how President Moon of South Korea now has a much stronger hand than uh, because the previous government has been uh, discredited and stuff. But if you yes. say, yeah, but if you look at, say, President Kim Dae jung in 2000s, in the late 90s and 2000s and his sunshine policy, but even that was, uh, that was, he was not able to take that forward because of a particular American stance. So, what specific situation in the United States and in South Korea is giving President Moon a much more stronger hand right now, as opposed to, say, a previous instance? One is that the opposition is much weaker at that time. Right? But above all, it is really the rise of China to the eminence that it has risen to, as well as the very, very comprehensive uh, strategic alliance between Russia and China, uh, and South Korea's decision, which goes far beyond President Mo, <coughs> to, in fact, seek an integration into that world of, you know, uh, sort of Trans-Korea railways getting integrated into Trans-Siberian railways and all of those various um, uh, economic uh, processes of economic integration. Uh, and Japan is now in a position at a point where it has to make up its mind. <laughs> Its economy is stagnating very bad. Uh, it will probably not move very far into this integration while Abe is in power, but it has to, it is now very much tempted by the offer from Russia and China th that the, <clears throat> not only the communications networks, but also gas and uh, and oil pipelines will go all the way through the Koreas into Japan. And Japan thus gets a direct access to the Eurasian markets all the way to Spain. So Japan is now in a much, is very different position economically. It is of course in the military alliance very much uh, tied up with the United States but economically, its position is softening. But it's above all the, the, the power, the economic power. Um, and I think the president, uh, or Chairman Kim, is much more willing to relax uh, the economic structure of North Korea for this integration. And that's where I think probably the Chinese influence also comes in. So uh, the decision has been made to take official level talks forward. I think uh, Mike, yeah. Mike Pompeo and the North Korean officials will be taking it forward. But considering the uh, nature of the U.S. establishment, which is both the Republicans and the Democrats have been uh, very, very, very critical of this move. And I think even earlier instances have where discussions happened, I think, have again broken down at the level of the establishment level. So does the established U.S. establishment, and although it's not a unitary structure, have any incentive to really uh, take this forward much? Because a lot of official declarations, even between in the period from April, uh, the end of April to May, also ended up actually uh, making the situation worse. So, My sense is uh, that if it doesn't go forward, at least in the uh, you know, the, uh, at least on the surface of it, if it doesn't go forward, um, it, Trump actually loses face, having taken this unilateral um, uh, initiative, um, so that he has the support from Pompeo, 
and that wing of his administration. There are people, you know, um, Bolton and so on, and the other side. So it is a very driven administration, and you don't know what what is coming next. And uh, Trump himself is so impulsive. So I would actually say that the opposition from <clears throat> either the Democrats or the even the Republicans doesn't really matter all that much. Trump is very much on his own. He has never relied on the, um, you know, the two-party structures in Washington. Uh, he relishes the idea of being above them all, and he relishes the idea of contrariness and all of that. So long as this plays well with his constituencies. Uh, so just in order to save his face and say, look, I'm doing all this to Europe and Canada and China because I'm strong and I want America to be first, but not because I'm belligerent. I can make peace with the worst enemy that we have. I'm a perfectly reasonable person. You know, so this is a self-presentation. And for that self-presentation, he needs some uh, <clears throat> Progress and that suits North, uh, North Korea and the Koreas perfectly well. I also think that the Koreas will keep flattering. You know, uh, we'll, we'll have statements from President Moon and so on. And, you know, uh, that will just and um, as you saw, at one point Trump had cancelled that, and President Moon uh, flew into. Uh, Washington and didn't leave until um, he had persuaded him to carry on. So that sort of thing will also get, go on there. But so you do think that the process will primarily be driven by the Koreas uh, in the coming months and maybe a, a next year or so? Wait, I don't know. You know, if I would use the word process, you know, I don't, I don't think there is a real process there. What it is, is opening up some space in which they will grant to Trump the idea that he's a great statesman. He's doing this, that, and the other. They will hold all those meetings and all that. On, so on the choreography, there will be a great deal of emphasis. But they understand as much as, uh, you know, we understand that uh, substantively, it's not going to go very far because the primary interest of the entire national security apparatus in the United States is on keeping both a nuclear posture and a very high level of the cutting edge weapon systems on the in South Korea as well as Japan. And the idea that Japan might become independent of the United States and start integrating with Russia and China is a nightmare. In, so substantively, that is the reality. Uh, but in terms of the choreography of it, I think some of it may very well go on for a year. So a long-term demilitarization is still quite a distance away is what you would be suggesting. Distance if it's coming at all, you know. Um, so far as demilitarization of the United States is concerned. You see, the, the, the beauty of it is that so long as some kind of um, show is going on with the United States, North and South can move on the, the peace declaration that came out of their summit, which was much more substantial. You know, it was, it was about three times as long declaration as the one that has come out to Trump's uh, summit. And there are very concrete steps that they have committed themselves to. And they can carry on with that. They can have a peace agreement, but obviously they cannot have a, an official declaration of war. Because, you know, I mean, South Korea is in a very strange position. On the one hand, it is one of the world's leading industrial powers and one of the most dynamic ones. 
uh, unlike Europe and the United States, it's not a stagnating economy. Uh, it's a very dynamic one. It's one of the major ones. And at the same time, it's a colony of the United States. It's, a, it's an occupied one. So um, <clears throat> uh, even, you know, just uh, legally, the two Koreas cannot bring that war to an end until the U.S. is a party to it. But they can do everything else uh, which will amount essentially to that and then carry on with the rest of the processes. Uh, for one thing, if South Korea can start delivering real uh, economic uh, relief to North Korea, if China can do it legally, it has been doing it otherwise, but if, if, if they can actually do it, then that process can, can begin very fast. And I think China has already indicated that trade relations should resume and North Korea has yeah. already lived up to its much of its promises. Yeah, yeah, you know the, the fact that he arrived on Air China is not a is, you know, in terms of symbolic, you know, show, show uh, and, um, In fact, act, actually, the China is a party to that war. They, you know, they lost a million lives um, for Korea, so they are actually a party to that war and bringing it um, to some sort of an end is also something important for them or to protect North Korea as much as they can. So actually also moving to China right now, I mean, uh, right. the Trump administration has been quoting China to, uh, what do you call it, ensure that this peace process goes smoothly. At the same time, there's also this tariffs policy that the US is all, the US is about to impose tariffs, I think. The latest news says that a substantial uh, very heavy tariffs, tariffs are on the way, although the summit went on uh, successfully. So the question is actually, what is the logic behind uh, this process? Because the process, there's there's a lot of uh, confusion even over the tariffs on the, uh, the EU and Mexico and Canada too. But and you and the United States and China have such a strong, a powerful, shall we say, relationships in terms of production and markets and. Uh, so, what exactly is the logic of this process, actually? Look, uh, as of now, China has a trade surplus with the U.S. in the magnitude of close to $400 billion a year. Even if the U.S. imposes all the tariffs that they are talking about, that comes to 15 to $16 billion. So it makes no dent. It has no material meaning. Uh, he is talking, he has picked up this big fight with Canada uh, unilaterally, uh, absolutely, you know, knowing what he was doing, insulting Trudeau personally in ways. But the tariffs, again, if you include services and everything, uh, uh, the United States actually runs a uh, trade um, surplus with, uh, with Canada. Uh, all right. So tariffs, tariffs on Europe and so on. Uh, I think it is very largely showmanship. Uh, again, speaking to its own um, support base in the country, because he has said from the beginning, it was one of the big things for him to say, all these countries of the world are exploiting us. They are just milking us like a cow, just etc. I am going to <clears throat> put them in their place, this, that, and the other, and so on. So it is all this symbolic stuff that he's doing. Uh, with China, the U.S. in fact doesn't know what to do because, yes, China is very dependent of the, on the U.S., but U.S. is just as dependent on China. Uh, China can retaliate. I don't believe they will retaliate very much. Uh, they will see that it is between domestic politics and 
But still, megalomania, it is this sort of thing, nothing very serious in long term thing. And China doesn't want to get into, you know, a kind of trade war or anything like that. They will even concede some of the things that the, these people are saying and so on in order to carry on with the policy that they need to pursue. Um, so uh, I, I, I think this is really playing to the gallery. <clears throat> and China has been the big enemy. Uh, in, in their entire propaganda, China is taking away the jobs from the U.S. workers. So I'm going to fix China. You know, so um, there is all of this business of the North, of the, of the, of the naval blockade or whatever you want to call it, uh, around China. So I, I, think, I think it's very largely that sort of thing. I don't think there is a very serious policy consideration that has gone into any of this. Thank you very much, Professor Emmer, for talking to us. Sure, sure. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. That's all we have time for today. Keep watching Newsly.